Tonight on Question Time, Harriet Harman, Solicitor General for England and Wales. Sir Malcolm Rifkin, Defence and then Foreign Secretary in the last Conservative Government. Nicola Sturgeon, Health Spokesman for the Scottish National Party. Michael Moore, who's on the Liberal Democrats' Foreign Affairs team. And the author of many bestsellers, including The Wasp Factory, Ian Banks. Well, good evening. Welcome to Glasgow and to a panel who, as always, don't know the questions that are going to be asked tonight. And if you want to take issue with what they say uh, during the programme, ring 07940242424 and uh, make your trenchant comments there. And to read what's being said by other people watching the programme, go to CFAX, page 155, or use your satellite handset. Let's go straight now to our first question, hidden away here, from Margaret Wilson. Margaret Wilson, please. Good evening. Is the 40% wage demand by the firefighters reasonable or ludicrous? Reasonable or ludicrous? Sir Malcolm Rifkind. Well, I don't think it's realistic to expect any group of people to get a 40% pay increase. I think the implications for the whole of the public sector would be too devastating. But I think also the problem that we face at the moment is that the independent inquiry that the government has set up was set up far too late. Uh, this inquiry should have been set up months ago. And it's also, it was established in September, and it's been told to report in December. That's three months. Now, you know, when you are facing an imminent strike uh, of uh, firemen next week, uh, that kind of luxury should not be in entertained. Is Bain, Bain wrong to say, I can't do it fast, I've yes. got, to do it, I've got well, to do it thoroughly? It depends on the support the government gives them and the instructions given by the government. We had a fire dispute way back in 1972, and the Wilberforce inquiry was set up. It sat for eight days, day and night because it was told there was an urgent need to come to a solution quickly as possible. And within eight days, they made recommendations. These recommendations eventually led to the resolution of the dispute. Now, if the government had the commitment, I'm sure it wants to solve this problem, I'm not suggesting otherwise, but it hasn't given it the priority needed. OK. And Nicholas, that is, uh, I think, a great mistake. Nicola Sturgeon. Well, I'll tell you what's not reasonable, and that's been the attempts by the government in the last few days to demonise firefighters. Yeah. We're dealing here with a <laughs> professional... <laughs> a professional group of people who, who do an essential job, often in very dangerous circumstances. And, you know, I think this is a, a point worth reflecting on. A married firefighter with two children, after five years' service, uh, has to rely on working families' tax credit. That's just plain wrong. So the firefighters do need a pay increase. And, you know, I think it's also worth uh, noting that we're in this position, we're on the brink of industrial action because the government interfered in the negotiations that were taking place between the firefighters and the employers. And I think the route out of this now is independent arbitration. But if that process is going to work, then it's got to be a mechanism that both sides have absolute confidence in. That's not the case with the Bain Commission. The firefighters don't have confidence in its membership. And crucially, they don't have confidence that even if they convince that commission of their case, that the government will implement it. Because the government, in okay. the form of Tony Blair and Gordon yeah. Brown, have more or less ruled out pay increases what about the question? more than inflation. What about the question? Well, I is think it it's for reasonable an or ludicrous well, to go for 40%? It's, it's reasonable for the firefighters to ask for professional pay. Exactly no, what sorry, pay, 40%. Well, is exactly the what that pay should be, I think, is a matter for independent arbitration. When the firefighters can put their case, as can the government, and that's the appropriate way but of there, proceeding. Uh, sorry, but I, don't, for that no, no, to I work, just want to pin you down on this because it's an important point. The question from Margaret Wilson is, is the 40% demand reasonable or ludicrous? Surely not, you can answer that no, question. No, that, that's not for me to say. I think that's a matter for an independent commission that all sides have confidence. Okay. You see, what I, what I tell you is all right, now you've said that. I, I get the firefighters that. get, get a professional Ma wage for right. a professional okay. job. Margaret Wilson, what do you say? Well, I think a 40% increase for anybody is absolutely ludicrous. We we'll probably ask for 40%. Okay. Settle for probably 20, which is You think great. it's ludicrous? Okay. It is, the yeah. man there wearing what looks suspiciously like a fire brigade. Is, um, yeah. I've got two points. First right. of all, it wasn't ludicrous for Tony Blair last year when he gave himself 40%. <laughs> <laughs> The second point is that we have not went in and asked for a 40% increase. What we have done, and our employers have agreed this, that we should be paid professional pay. Now, we are, have said that the average professional pay is £30,000 a year, as the Labour Research Department has done on our behalf and looked at. Now, the average professional pay of £30,000, the fact that it's taken a 40% increase of our current levels to get to that, it's a clear indication of how much our pay has fallen behind. And I don't think it's unreasonable. 
to ask for an average pay in the professional sector. OK, Harriet Harman. Well, I think an immediate 40% increase would not be reasonable but I don't think it's unreasonable for the firefighters to say that they think that they have got left behind and that they want a decent increase. And I think what we want to see is a settlement. We want to see a negotiated settlement. And I understand very well indeed from, from firefighters in my own area that the firefighters themselves want a settlement. And I know that people, we don't want to strike in government, Nobody does, because we don't want any property to be damaged, let alone lives to be lost. But I know that even more than us not wanting uh, a strike, that firefighters themselves, who are proud of the job you do, don't want a strike uh, and, not, and have to walk away from, from your duty, quite apart from your finances being on the line. So we're, I think we're in favour of the same objective, which is fair pay. Uh, and it's going to be more, Nicola, than what's been put on the table. I think that... That obviously makes sense. Um, so I think we need fair pay and we need a decent professionalised service. And I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic with uh, the FBU talking to John Prescott tonight that we can have a settlement. We want to support our public services. We want to support our uh, public servants. Um, and I hope that we can uh, what, what, have a, a settlement. Second, what, what do you say to the point that Malcolm Rifkin made that um, George Bain should speed up his work with the government's help so that a proper settlement can be reached? Do you think that's a good idea or not? Well, I, I would find it a bit... I, I don't necessarily agree with sitting here and saying to, to George Bain, who's the, the man that chaired the Low Pay Commission, who brought employers and unions together to introduce the minimum wage, somehow that he's lolling about and not pulling his finger yeah, out. Suggesting that. I think that he ought to be doing it as quickly as he possibly can. Okay. I think he ought to have all the resources that he possibly can. And I think he ought to hear the very good case from the fire brigades union. And I think if there's problems about the terms of reference or anything about the way that he's doing that, I hope that that might be resolved between John Prescott and uh, the FBU so that there can be a negotiated settlement and we can get out of the deadlock. Nobody okay, wants no, no, the deadlock well, the, the that we're in. The woman in the second row there. Sorry, I'll come to you again in a moment. The woman there. If the government are claiming that there isn't the funds to actually implement, OK, 40% is a little bit too high. Um, how come we've got millions of pounds to chuck out about three miles of road maintenance, which is the recent annou announcement of you know, X amount of money towards you know, roads? I mean, I, I, can I just yeah, correct something yeah. that Nicola said? I don't think the government is saying we haven't got this amount of money or we haven't got that I'm amount of money. That no, no, no. No, what they've said is that we want a negotiated settlement. Well, we can you guarantee the... that if, if the firefighters were to convince an independent commission, if, if there could be a process that everybody had confidence in, that they were worth 40% extra pay, would the government honour that and would they fund the employers to implement that pay increase? Can you say that yes tonight? What I can say is we would be yes honour no. bound. Absolutely. Well, that is absolutely yes crucial yes no. to building the firefighters confidence in the independent process you've got to say that you'll be bound by it otherwise how can you in all conscience ask firefighters to submit to that process okay. i think i think that the the local government employers could agree to go to binding arbitration they could if the fire brigades union accepted that but i don't think government can contract out decisions about pay but I do think that we having set up the inquiry would more or less be honour bound, be duty bound, that's what ministers have been saying to um, accept uh, the, 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 the findings but I think that actually the findings would be a platform for negotiation, that's what we need to do, break the, the log jam, get negotiations and settle the strike, settle before the strike happens on fair okay. terms. Okay, hold on, yeah, I'll come to you again, Michael Moore. I think that, in answer to the original question, that 40% uh, is uh, not something that is going to be achievable. Uh, but I think it's important that we acknowledge that firefighters, day in, day out, put themselves put their lives on the line and make huge risks on our behalves, uh, both to save life and to save our property. What is important is that we actually get people talking. And I don't think it's been terribly helpful until the last couple of days for people to get stuck into camps where they said they wouldn't talk to each other. It's absolutely vital that that is, it is done. And Harriet has made a couple of important concessions here this evening. She said that they will get more than has been promised already. That must be a very good sign of progress. She's also said uh, that the 
government is virtually honour bound to uh, fulfil the commitments and the promises that that inquiry comes out with. Let's get the independent inquiry underway. Let us ensure that they get both sides trusting the process, getting involved and then not letting the Chancellor, as he was doing the other day, undermine the possible outcomes. Okay. You sit in the front here. Yes. Harriet Harman said it was... Um, indefensible I think all at once and Michael Moore said that it was unachievable all at once. Can I ask the politicians in the panel what your last pay increase was and whether you took it all at once? Well, um, I don't know whether Harry Harman, do you want to answer that? Do you want to answer the point that was made about the Prime Minister taking 41% as was said? Uh, be, be brief about it, if you would, and then I want to go on to Ian Banks. I think, I think that, I mean, I'm very sympathetic from where the question is coming from, and I think the issue about fair pay across the public sector is very important. There, there's, there's people who are in the public sector who are paid a great deal more than firefighters, and there are some people who are also saving lives in their own way, like care attendants working in old people's homes, who are paid a great deal less. I would like to see across the country a narrowing of the gap between the rich and the poor, a fairer pay system. Um, can, can, you ask, can you ask, answer his question, which is obviously on the public record, uh, what your last pay increase was, because you're a government employee. And whether you took it all at once, or said, you know, that's all? too much. Um, can you remember what I it was? I think it was... I, I'm, I do beg your pardon. I'm sure that uh, Nicola will I mean, remember what uh, my pay increase was <laughs> or somebody else's. But I, but I, I still um, remember you know. that MP's pay increase was bigger than MSP's, but MSP's pay increase was too big. I think we got 13.5%. I argued against it at the time, but you know, I think Did you there's take a, it? There's a, well, Did you take it? It was put into my pay packet. I give a proportion of it to charity because I argued against it, and I think that's the okay. honourable thing right. to do. But can, I, is can I say there is a. David, because politicians rightly are, are caught up on this all the time. The, the important thing is that it was, a two, it was actually a stage uh, pay increase, the last uh, one that we got, and yes, we, we took it as it was offered to us. But the important thing was it was decided by an independent outside body, and that's what we need to resolve the fire brigade dispute. Okay, here. all right. I, to the man up there, the green shirt on the back there. You say yes. Um, men, th this review that we're talking about, the firefighters, uh, it was an independent review that they had put forward that gave them the, the wage of £30,000. And when we talk about this new review that's ongoing at the moment, it's a sham because Tony Young told the firefighters at the start of the review that the fire brigade junior is not going to like what they get, and they're not going to get that. They're not going to get what they want. So, what, what do you want? The strike and to hell with all these uh, negotiations with independent review bodies and George Never, Bay and all that. Firefighters control staff are the last people that want to go on strike. But what we, what we want the people to realise is there's already been umpteen reports done into the fire service, and. Whenever it comes down to cost and money, or, sorry, but whenever the government gets a report, their idea of modernisation is to save money. Their idea of modernisation is to save life. OK. Yeah. You, Madam, in the front. Is the woman in the front in, in Bran there? Do you think anybody would particularly notice if any of the panel, the politicians in the panel, went and strike? I don't think so. <laughs> right. Well, we'll come... Can Hold on. No, 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 you can't. No, we're going to come to the one non-politician on the panel, Ian okay. Banks. Um, hi, non-politician here. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, go back to the lady's mm -hmm. original question, I think it's entirely reasonable that the firemen are paid, uh, you know, £30,000 or there, thereabouts. What's ludicrous <laughs> is that they've been allowed to slip behind to this extent for so long. This is what government is supposed to be about, damn it. They're supposed to head this stuff off at the past. Um, I think the firemen, Tony Blair ought to be right behind the firemen because they're going from being, like, effectively classed as unskilled, you know, manual workers, which in a sense maybe they were back in, you know, towards the last uh, fire strike, to being what I think they're rightly claiming now to being skilled professionals. You should be right with them going from working class to being middle class. You know, you should be right behind new labour. So why the hell aren't they paid, paid properly? OK, the woman over there on the right with spectacles, you, madam. I think it's very interesting that Harriet Harman can't quite remember what her pay rise is and when she got it. She obviously has far more money than firefighters who know exactly what they're paid and when they last got a decent increase. OK, Harriet Harman, thank you. I just tick, pick up the point about the idea that, th that the Labour government wants to save money. We did not struggle against the Tories to get elected to save money on public services. We got into government in order to spend more money on public services, and we have done that. On, we have done it on health, 
we've done it on education, we've done it across the board. That's what we're to do, to actually invest in public services and have decent public but services in this country, and that's what we've been doing. The people who are okay. delivering the public the services are not getting the benefit of that. Nurses in the health service are firefighters. They're not mm. seeing the benefit of the extra money you allege to be investing okay. in. Okay, the, the man in the blue shirt there. Mm. Yes, Harriet Harman sounds very supportive of the firefighters, but is it then therefore fair that the government should use propaganda to undermine their cause and, and, and say things like that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to put people's lives at risk by going on strike and, and almost blackmail the fire, firefighters and push them into a corner? Is that a fair response? Prime, Prime Minister was alleged to have said they were Scargalite. Well, yeah, but this, this, is isn't it, is it not? Is it not the case that there are allegedly people in the Labour Party, in, in New Labour, sorry, um, who are basically <laughs> spoiling for a fight? They're saying this is like our minor strike. That's a disgraceful attitude. How dare they even be thinking that? <laughs> uh, I agree with Ian on that latter point. I don't think there's any remote comparison with Scargill and with the, the minor strike. But there is a point that I think the firemen and the firefighters themselves need to address. They are now, as has been said, very impressive professional people. I think professional people, uh, like firefighters, should increasingly think of themselves like the armed forces, like the police, people who do have occasional disputes, but do not withdraw their labor, given the possible loss of life, given the huge implications if firefighters stop carrying out their tasks. What, do you think so they I should like have a no-strike deal? I would, like to see, I would like to see that. I believe that would be hugely welcomed by the general public, and I think firefighters should be like police officers, they should be like the armed forces, they carry out an important, crucial task, they should be paid properly, but they should also accept the responsibility that withdrawing their labour is not... All right, well, I'll go back to you, because I said I would. Do you think the idea of a no-strike deal would be a good one for firefighters in return for a good wage or salary? Well, I want to, the, the thing about Scargillite says that in the last hundred years of UK fire service, there's only been one national strike in a hundred years, and that was to take firefighters in the 70s out of low pay. But, but what but, do you say about his suggestion that a no-strike deal would be part of it? Well, the problem is there's been, there's been strikes in individual brigades throughout the country in the last five, six years, Essex, Merseyside, Derbyshire, to protect the public, not for, to get one single penny for control staff or firefighters, but to stop the closures of stations, to stop the closure and the loss of fire engines and, and fire personnel. It's to maintain what we've already got, and it's to maintain the safety of the public. And it's interesting now that the government want to talk to us now about safety. Safety. If they bothered to talk about us about pay six months ago, we wouldn't need to talk about safety. Okay, and the woman over there, and then I think we'd better move on. Yes. Miss Harmon made a statement there the government cannot farm out uh, wages to private companies, i.e., example. Uh, they have just taken the wages and the retirement pensions of civil servants to a private company out of the Paymaster General's office. So that if that's not farming out, I don't know what is. I think what I was meaning is they can't, we, can't, can't, we can't give to somebody else the decision. Um, that's what I was saying we can't do. Has to be your but I don't agree with Malcolm Rifkin that the way to, to stop the strike is to rob the, the fire, uh, firefighters of the right to strike. I think the way to stop the strike is to have a settlement um, and, and to have fair pay and improving public services. All right, well, we're going on to another question now. Just before we do, uh, question time is going to be in Leeds next week, Croydon the week after. To join us, ring 09011114411 or apply by our website, BBC website slash question time. You can also argue about all the issues that are being discussed here, there. And remember, text us right now if you want to on 07940242424 and check CFAX page 155 to read what other people watching this programme are thinking and we go on to another question this is from Alexis Gruber Alexis uh, Gruber please yes, yes. Uh, should the media have the right to pub to publish the name of the alleged rapist of Miss Ulrika Johnson should the media have the right to publish the name could I just say the BBC's policy is not to name this man so I'd be grateful if in this discussion nobody did name him uh, but the question is should the media have the right to publish the name uh, you're the Solicitor General what do you think I think, should they be banned from publishing a name? Uh, no, I don't think they should be banned from publishing a name. But I think that if, if allegations are being made that a rape's taken place, I would like to see those allegations taken to the police. I'd like to see them investigated, and I'd like to see them uh, prosecuted. I, I don't like to see... Uh, I think that it's, it's not necessarily right to do it by virtue of um, publishing an autobiography or by going to Max Clifford and selling your story to the Daily Mail, 
but there are serious issues here and I think that there are many women who will see the story that's come out from Eureka Johnson and which has been followed by others and themselves will have been raped and suffered in silence and I want them to know that they can report it to the criminal justice system. It will be taken seriously and we must have an end to this idea that uh, men think that it's, uh, that it's okay if a woman's saying no, that he can just carry on and rape her anyway. So you think... Do you think even so many years later she should now go to the police if she's got a, a serious allegation to make? The thing about sexual offences is that in many cases it takes a great many years for the victim to feel able to come forward and kind of admit what's happened to them. Somehow it creates a sense of shame and uh, uh, people feel very, very uh, uncomfortable about coming forward. And I see many cases in my job of people who have kept a terrible secret which has tortured them for years and have not been able to report. And often when they do come forward, they're treated sympathetically and very often the, the perpetrator okay. will pe plead guilty because once he's challenged on his behaviour, he, he will often plead guilty. So I would say to the many people who are harbouring awful what they feel are secrets, that they've been uh, uh, vic victims of a, a, a criminal offence, a sexual offence. It is not your fault. It is not a private matter. The police are there to investigate, come forward and report it, and you will be treated sy sympathetically. Michael Moore, should the media have the right to publish the name? I think this has turned into a real mess and the danger for us is that two highly complex and sensitive issues have been intertwined in a way that is going to make it very, very difficult to get the right outcome. I don't believe that somebody should be in a position where they are potentially being libelled and clearly something has to be done to crystallise what is either a, a, a serious charge or the, 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 these allegations are withdrawn. At the moment uh, an individual is walking around with the whole world talking about them uh, with serious allegations and no way of actually bringing that to a head other than taking on all of the media through the libel court. What's your suggestion of a way out, as you put it? Well, we clear, well we're going to have to review the libel laws because clearly this is an intolerable position. The, but the equally serious point that Harriet makes but it's is up to him if he sues for libel. It is up he's to him. He's got the opportunity if he wants to. Indeed, but I mean, he's got to make a very careful uh, decision here about whether, in the libel case, uh, he is willing to have absolutely every other piece of his life drawn out and put into the public domain, as will inevitably happen in a libel case, uh, as a part of this. But I think he's rapidly being left with very little choice but to okay. do that. But the important point, I also want to say, is that we mustn't obscure that this is highlighting the, the quite separate issue of, of date rape and rape generally. That has got to uh, be uh, tackled and we mustn't allow the concerns about one person's rights in court and the public domain to be obscure that equally sensitive okay. and hard issue. The, the woman then in, in the purple dress. I think that this case has opened up a whole can of worms. Um, you've got two separate issues. You've got the rights of the victim and um, how the public treat that person and then you've got the rights of the accused um, who as far as I see is innocent until proven guilty. Um, <laughs> And up until now, if I can just finish, up until now, um, everyone seems to be just assuming that this person who has been accused of the crime is guilty. And people I've been speaking to tonight have said exactly the same thing. Um, at the same time, the public are um, sort of criticising the way that this case has been brought out, saying it shouldn't have been put in an autobiography. But as has already been said by members of the panel, it was a very brave thing to do. And we have to applaud Ulrika for coming forward, because that could help protect other people in the future. OK. The, the woman in the second row here. You, man. Yes, with myself. Um, I think that uh, they shouldn't be allowed to publish any allegation, you know, the person that's alleged to have raped them. I don't think that should be allowed to be put into the press until it's been proven guilty. Ian Burns? Uh, but it's an incredibly difficult uh, question. I think it's um, should they be allowed to? It, dep it depends on what, they, what exactly the rules are. Is it, the trouble is at the moment that the only way to really sort of respond is to you know go into the whole libel issue, which can be you know, very expensive for a start. And newspapers have got lots of money to defend themselves with. Um, so individuals have to think of that. And you know, as Michael was saying, you've got this whole problem that every single other you know. Uh, issue and facet of your life is, is going to be, you know, sort of dried into the public view, which a lot of people, you know, most people wouldn't, wouldn't like very much. Um, it's just a very, very <coughs> difficult one. I, I don't think in the end, I suspect in the end that it probably is something that has to be tackled through a different set of libel laws and perhaps some other way, some other way of adjudicating 
on this sort of stuff, but um, it's, it's, just, it's just so messy. I think it's, it's the trouble with something uh, with a crime like rape, where it's basically one person saying it's happened and another person saying it hasn't. It's always going to be sort of messy in that sense. It's always do, going to do be... Do you think there's any obligation on Ulrika Johnson, now that this name is being banded about, either to go to the police and lay a charge or, or, to, or to say you've got the wrong person? In a, in a sense, you know, uh, what you, ultimately what you really want is for, you know, to be fewer rapes and for when, when a man does rape, rape somebody, a man or a woman for that matter, um, that more of them are caught. So whatever leads to that is the best solution. But how would you get there? <laughs> Frankly, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not claiming to, but I don't think that... Um, uh, I think there just aren't, aren't any sort of uh, really easy answers. But I think the, the point is that apparently she said that she'd never meant this man's name to come out. Yeah. Now, if, if that's that true and she hasn't put, you know, some whisper about it or whatever, then I think you have to take it at her word. But ideally, yes, you do, you know, you, you accuse your, your attacker, your rapist. Uh, Ale Ale Alexis Gruber asked the question, what, what's your view of this? Well, my view is uh, it's a matter of uh, freedom of speech, you know. This is supposed to be a free society, you know. Why there is a problem, why if I say a name, I can be liable, you know. Why, there has, why the law allows a certain level of censorship, I, I think that at the end of the day, I, I know there is a tension between the rights of the accused and freedom of speech, but freedom of speech must, uh, in my opinion, must prevail. This is one of the basic things of free society. Malcolm Rifkin? Well, Can you answer that point? It, yeah. it, is, it is right that a woman should be encouraged to go to the police even years later, but when, the, when she goes to the police, her allegations will be investigated privately. And only if the police are satisfied there is real evidence against the person will that person be publicly charged. What has happened in the last few days is, in my view, a disgrace. Uh, the media are extremely powerful. And if the media mentions someone's name, that person, let us assume, we don't know, let us assume that person is totally innocent. That person's reputation has already been massively damaged. And whatever happens over the weeks and months to come, even if no charges are ever leveled against him, many people will say, ah, there's no smoke without fire, he probably was guilty, they just couldn't get the evidence, and all sorts of things of that kind. And so the media are in a different position to a private conversation. And I think the, whatever the law might say at the moment, I think newspapers or television or radio that publish the name, which basically accuse somebody of a crime, and the media don't have the evidence, all they have are various allegations that may have been put to them. That is uh, against the public interest, and if the law doesn't stop it at the moment, the quicker the law is changed, the better. Yes, So, yeah, no, no, no. The man, the man in the Hi, sorry, do you not think uh, Ruka Johnson would have been better off uh, mentioning this before she brought a book out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, me mentioning it to, well, my point mentioning being the police. That, yeah, she should have reported it. I mean, it's Lady been, what, 14 years yeah. since this incident, alleged incident, has happened. Mm. You know, it's a long time, and, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not getting on anyone who's, who has or has not been raped, but, I mean, 14 years, and then all of a sudden to, to write a book that's been sold in every high street shop for nearly fifteen pounds and the publicity she's getting, I think it's there's you know, there's there's a bit of a rat there, I think, you know. Okay, and the the woman on the on the edge of the gangway there. Yeah. I think that whenever Ulrika Johnson came out with this claim, she would have been criticised when she was a nineteen year old weather girl and she um Get, you know, brought the allegations forward to the police. She would have been criticised then for trying to further her career. So it wouldn't have mattered at any point because she's in the public domain. Whenever she brought this out, she would have been of accused of trying to further furthering her career. Well, do you not think she's got a duty to the public that she's in the public eye no. to say specifically who no, has or has not, not allegedly raped certainly her? Certainly not. That is for of the police. Of course she has. No, it's not. That is for the police alone to investigate allegations. She doesn't have to tell. It's her private life. She's been so raped. She She's been violated. So why should she make money it, you know, by reading a book, you know, if she's, if she's not going to say whether yes or not? No, but she has never mentioned the man. She has never named the man. Everybody's just assuming that it is this certain person. But she has never made allegations uh, towards the man that I everyone's assuming one thing? that it is. You said something about when she was a weather girl and this was alleged to have happened. Uh -huh. are, are, you, are you saying... She should or shouldn't have gone to the police and made well, a complaint. I think she should have went to the police, but what I'm saying is at that point in time, she would still have been criticised for trying to further her career. I also believe that women who do um, bring charges like this forward um, and go, th go through the courts, the way that um, these, especially the, cro the cross examination, the way that's actually put forward, a woman's sexual history is dragged through the mud in order to s discredit evidence against her, but the um, accused. Um, sexual history is not brought forward because it's okay. not relevant to the trial. Yeah. So is it any wonder that women don't report <coughs> serious sexual crimes? Yeah.
Nicola Sturgeon. I, I think where I would agree with, with the last speaker from the audience there is, is we shouldn't lose sight in all this discussion about the personality involved. The, the victim here is Ulrika Johnson. She was the victim of a rape. But to go back to Alexis's original question, you know, I, 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 well, she was a victim of a rape. It's alleged as to who did it. Uh, but to go back to the original question, I believe no, I believe alleged. newspapers shouldn't be no, above the law. It is an alleged rape. I believe I mean, newspapers. She, it's her allegation that she was raped. It's not been tested well, by a court or yeah. by the police. To go back to the question, I believe newspapers shouldn't be above the law. They should observe libel laws. Although I think perhaps what's been highlighted is that libel laws are inadequate to deal with the modern media age. What I don't believe is that anybody, no matter what they're accused of, should be tried by the media. Harriet Harman's absolutely right. Too many women who uh, are already traumatised by the experience of rape feel unable to make a report to the police. Uh, and that is, I think, unfortunate. And anybody who's been raped should be encouraged to report it and allow it to be investigated And do you properly. think she should do that well, even now? I, I want to come on to Rika Johnson because I think the, the issue now is that she has made the decision to go public albeit she hasn't made the decision to name uh, the alleged r rapist, but she's made the decision to go public. And I think she has a responsibility both to herself and to other victims of rape to do that responsibly, to report it to the police, to allow the police to investigate it. And if there is evidence of a rape having taken place and of particular guilty of that for a trial to be brought and for the person to be tried in a court of law, that's how it's appropriate to proceed. OK. I think the first lesson we we're all have to learn from this is the rape law is so complicated and so traumatic for Andy that needs to be reviewed and I would be prepared to bet that it's easier for the alleged rapist to go through a libel case than it would be for Ulrika Johnson to go through a rape case. OK, and you sir in the front. Have been yes. I've yes. got two points to make. Um, first of all, it's a sad day in my life when I agree with Malcolm Rifkin, but he is correct <laughs> in what he says, that the mud will stick to the individual involved, regardless of guilt, innocence and anything else. And just to respond to Harriet Harman, um, you were right, of course, when you say that women should be able to avail themselves of the justice system, but Ulrika Johnson hasn't tried to do that. She's put it in, the auto in her autobiography to make herself money. She's gone to Max Clifford and other individuals. She's not, yeah. She hasn't it's tried to do that. She's not tried to avail herself of that. She's tried to make money from it. And if she was raped, she should have gone to the police, not put it in an autobiography. OK. And, and the man behind in the fourth row, you, sir. I believe rape to be one of the most heinous crimes imaginable. Uh, what I would actually do to rapists, I can't say, prime time television. Well, having said that, do you not know think, to go back to the original point about the media handling of this, they're in danger of actually turning what's a very serious matter into a soap opera and almost to an extent trivialising it? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's your view of it, uh, yeah. how you see it happening, yes. All right. Yeah. And, and, and the woman over there on the left, please the name because it is turning into a media frenzy and I think although I sympathise it's a very very serious issue but when Ulrika Johnson chose to use the media as a vehicle to express what had happened to her albeit a long time ago I think she was playing quite a da dangerous game and although it's a very serious matter I think we need to get back to the serious matter of victims and how they can be supported and to try and do that. Okay. Anybody else on this? Okay. I just take one more point from the woman at the front here. Yes. Yes. The, the naming of this individual, not just another case of the media getting the bit between their teeth and hounding in an individual or individuals and for the public's right to know. Anybody on the panel want to pick that point yeah, up? Well, I think, there, I, mean, I think there's a crucial distinction between the public interest and the public are interested. You know, <laughs> uh, and the media sometimes ignore that distinction, and it's a great pity that they do. OK, let's move on. Thank you very much, everybody, to another question. This is from Chris Whitfield, please. Chris Whitfield. Is, is Estelle Morris's main deficiency as a politician that she's too honest and conscientious? Too honest and conscientious. Nicola Sturgeon? Well, she certainly was honest, and uh, there are perhaps uh, a few other ministers, both uh, south of the border and here in Scotland, that could do with following her lead and admitting they're not up to the job. Uh, I think the irony, the irony is that uh, Estelle Morris was perhaps not as bad as a lot of other ministers in office. In fact, uh, she perhaps has less to apologise for uh, than our own first minister here in Scotland, but she's gone and he's still in post. So I think, I think her honesty uh, should be applauded. Uh, but I think this is a serious blow for Labour. You know, the battle cry in the 1997 election was education, education, education. And yet we have an education secretary uh, resigning. 
and Labour's education policy seemingly uh, in chaos as a result. I think the last point I would make, of course, is that I say all this uh, as a, a casual observer, since Estelle Morris uh, was not the Education Secretary in Scotland. We have our own one in Scotland, and perhaps she's uh, near the top of the list of people who should follow Estelle Morris's lead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Ian Banks. Uh, well, by the sound of it, um it's always best to let news ask the people at the sharp end. You know, if you don't know what's going on in a hospital, you ask like the nurses and uh, care workers and so on. In the case of education, you ask the teachers. And apparently, from what I've been hearing, um, they are actually quite upset that she has gone. Um, I think you yeah, have to admire her honesty. I think she has, in a sense, done the honourable thing. If she's done the right thing or not, uh, it's hard to say. And I think one of the things that, that sort of helped us sort of scupper was this thing about having to, after the Soham murders, um, was the sudden decision to check everybody who was going to be in school, which actually at one point meant there was children wandering around in urban streets instead of relatively safely in classrooms. That wasn't her decision. She came back from her holidays to find this had been done, but she, of course, had to carry the can. Um, I think having seen uh, previous administrations, um, you know, sort of ministers staying on basically forever, no matter what they'd done wrong, um, in which it's, it's, it's encouraging in a sense to see a minister perhaps leaving uh, before she should have. Uh, but I think perhaps it does kind of indicate, and I'm, obviously I'm an innocent this, being the non-political person on the panel, but it does not indicate the size of her department is maybe too big and that perhaps some of the, in, the, uh, the, the decisions were being made, not even by junior ministers as such, but by civil servants. I know they do this a lot of the time anyway, but um, if a minister is uh, actually, someone like Vesta Morris's um, qualifications is saying it was too much for me, maybe the ministry itself mm -hmm. is too big and it should be sort of subdivided. Um, Harriet Harman, you got sacked, of course, before you were reappointed. <laughs> um, and and, and you, could, could you see yourself ever doing a mayor culpa and saying, oh, I'm sorry, Prime Minister, I wasn't very good at that job, but so I think I'll quit? Well, as you say, I didn't, I didn't resign, but I think the, the, the question was... <laughs> the question was about Estelle Morris. Um, asking what was her, her deficiency as a politician, and, and I want to say I don't think that she is deficient as a politician. And I think she was a very good Secretary of State. And I think it's sad that she didn't have the confidence in herself that certainly I and most of the rest of us in the House of Commons, well, all of the rest of us in the House of Commons had in her. And the fact of the matter is that that there are children being better educated in smaller classes and in with more teachers who are better supported and there's more investment in education. And that is Estelle's legacy from when she was Minister for School Standards and when she was Secretary of State. And I think that her legacy ought also to be a discussion as to why it is that we're in the situation we are in now where education has been a priority for the government, has had more investment. The Secretary of State was working with the teachers, albeit they disagreed mm. from time to time, mm. and yet we find ourselves with the Secretary of State uh, toppled. So I think that it's a very sad day uh, for education. But when you say toppled, it's a rather odd way of putting it, isn't it? I mean, she said in her letter to the Prime Minister that I feel I was better at the first job than this one and I don't like a big department. That's, that's what the question means by honest and conscientious. And you're saying, you know, you all think she was doing a grand job, but you sort of couldn't persuade her she was. Well, I think she'd had enough. She had come under an enormous oh. amount of pressure. And she perhaps doesn't have the ability to have a hide as thick as a rhino. She does have perhaps the ability to be self-critical, which many other politicians and ministers don't have. But I don't think it's right that you should have to have the hide of a rhino and an absolute absence of self-criticism to be a success in politics. And right, I do okay. think... I'm I would I wanted say, to ask you whether you no, had the hide of I a rhino, have, but I'm not sure I've learned that I can. Sometimes. But I do think <laughs> that actually... Uh, some people will say, oh, well, if okay. she can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. But I think that it is harder uh, it, for a woman as a minority, a great minority in, in government. And I think that with a male-dominated parliament, a male-dominated government being reported onto the public by a male-dominated press, it is harder for a woman. And I'm sorry that Estelle is not our Secretary of State. I think she was a good one. Okay. Um. Was it because she was a woman, Malcolm Rifkin, that she went, do you think? No, I don't think so at all. I mean, uh, I, don't, I can't imagine Margaret Thatcher having ever said, I'm really not up to being Prime Minister. I think it's about time for me to step down. Shame. I, I, well, that, that's a shame. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I, I, I don't think it's anything to do with Estelle Morris's sex. I think, no, I, I agree with Harriet that I think if you are a Secretary of State of a major department in the public eye, there's an incredible pressure upon you. Some people can cope with it. Some politicians actually enjoy coping with it. Uh, others are normal, joined-up members of the human race and don't like it very much. And Estelle Morris clearly was part of the latter. But in part, she was the author of her own misfortune. Uh, you know, if you agree to take over a department which has been incredibly centralised since the government came to office, the huge amount of power that is now concentrated in a Secretary of State for Education, far more than any time in the last 40 years, and that is something which she has agreed to preside over, has now found the pressures too great. And uh, I hope that, quite apart from her own fate, I hope that Tony Blair and the government will give some further thought to whether it is necessary for them to be control freaks in the way they run education, uh, as well as in so many other areas okay. of our life. The man in the green shirt there at the back. I'm just wondering whether the pressure uh, which she was under came from the decisions which she made uh, within her job or whether it came from um, the other ministers. Which, one, which pressure it was that made her uh, resign? Pressure from other ministers? Yes, there's no. sort of pressure from the government to, um, uh, to deliver. Michael Moore. Well, there was a real sense of shock uh, in the House of Commons when the news uh, sped round uh, about the resignation of Estelle Morris. People of all parties were absolutely amazed that it had happened. And it has caused a period of reflection, and I don't think that's any bad thing. Uh, we need to think about our politics and the way what we expect of people in government. But I think Estelle Morris has laid down uh, some good principles which we should bear in mind in the future. It has been a very, very long time uh, since anybody uh, resigned because they didn't think they were up to the job or because they thought they had let the side Has, has there ever been somebody who's done that before? There have been people who have re uh, resigned years ago on points of honour. Uh, I mean, let's remember uh, there have been uh, Francis Pym uh, wanted to, to go, if I recall, or Lord, Lord Carrington during the Falklands War because they felt that they were actually not up uh, to the job. Francis Pym, of course, was sacked. But uh, the, the, the point is that we have got a new principle established in our, in our government, and we all, either as politicians acting in the game or those who are watching from the outside, need to reflect on what we expect. OK. The, the man in the red shirt there with the white stripes. Uh, Estelle quoted the intensive media uh, speculation and pressure has been one of the major reasons she resigned. We're not in danger that slowly we're driving good people out of politics with a constant scrutiny, not looking at policies, but just always looking at them. The pressure, pressure, pressure. Nicola Sturgeon. Well, politicians should be open to maximum scrutiny, but much more of it should be on uh, the substance of the job that they do and perhaps less on personality. I think the sad thing about the Estelle Morris affair is that it's people who do expect high standards of themselves, who are uh, prepared to be tough on themselves as they feel they're not meeting those standards, uh, and who are incredibly self-critical and e expect themselves to do a good job, are exactly the type of people we should have in government. And what's all too common these days, I think, are ministers who are not up to the job, who are making a mess of it, but who insist on hanging on. And there's an interesting parallel in Scotland. If you cast your mind back two years to our own exam scandal, when everybody in Scotland thought Sam Gobraith, the then education minister, should resign, and he insisted in hanging on. And it seems that nobody, apart from the Tories, thought that Estelle Morris should have resigned, and she went, I, I know what I think was the more honourable course to have taken, and it wasn't the one Sam Gobraith took back in uh, 2000. OK, and you, sir? and Estelle Morris and the work that she has done over the last couple of years, I think it's been admirable. And I want to ask the question, or begs the question, is there no longer a place for dignity and integrity in British politics? But, uh, what, what's your view, that she should have stayed or gone? I think she should have stayed. She was, she was doing a good job, a very difficult job, and it's as unfortunate that good people are leaving politics, whereas it's the people who should leave stay and hang on. What, you're talking about everybody around this table except for... <laughs> the, the no, but what, but, but, but what do you mean, that she, that she her analysis of, uh, of uh, her explanation of why she left uh, should have been one that wasn't necessary, that people can well, stay there when they're not, when they say they're not running the department properly, they're not on top of the job? Well, no, no I, think, I think that if everybody was truthful, truthful we can do, be, be doing better jobs all the time. I think she has been honest and unfortunately like, the pressure of the media, the whole intrusion, the personalities of politics have won through, politics have lost. Okay, and, and you sir, in the blue shirt. It's not just governments that should be effective, it should be oppositions as well. I don't think oppositions either at Westminster or uh, in Edinburgh have been effective. Should those people involved in those then think about resigning if they haven't done a particularly good job? You're looking very 
You were all looking well, rather, rather you, sort of you would expect to see, I think, uh, the, the SNP opposition in Holyrood has done uh, an exceptionally good job, I think, uh, on a number of key areas. We've, we've held this failing Scottish executive to account, but I think all politicians should be more honest with themselves. That doesn't always mean resigning, but, you know, occasionally take a step back and say, you know, how did I do there? Could I have done that better? What would I do differently if I had the chance to do it again? I don't think perhaps any of us do that nearly enough, and I think it would fit all of us better to do it a bit more. None of us are perfect. Uh, some of us are far from it, and we should all seek to learn from our own experiences as well as other people's and always be striving to do our jobs better. And sometimes the, the really brave decision is to do that and then decide you're sticking uh, to make sure that you learn from your experiences. So, you know, I think uh, perhaps we can all learn something from the experience of Estelle Morris. OK. Another question, please. Alison Rice. Does the panel agree with the decision of the Community Fund to award a National Lottery grant to the National Coalition of Anti-Deportation Campaigns? Um, Michael Moore. I think we've got to be very careful here. Uh, I don't know much about the organisation in question. What I do know is that it has been vilified in the press uh, over the last uh, few days. And it takes a very uh, sensitive issue in public policy arena where we're dealing with the future and the lives uh, of, of people who are asylum seekers or otherwise and suddenly tries to demonise that whole process. I think it's entirely legitimate that there should be a voice for the asylum seekers and that, that we, should consider, we should look at ways of funding it. I think it's also entirely appropriate that the different lottery funds should be left to take their independent decisions. And interestingly enough, although I don't speak for her politics, she'll speak for her own, it is the, you know, the wife of a former Conservative minister who chairs this particular fund uh, and I think that therefore we can see there's political balance there is a wide range of expertise in the decisions that are taken and what we mustn't allow to happen is that people get victimized and we get uh, newspapers deciding where the good causes in this country it are. seemed to be David Blunkett and um, <laughs> seemed to be seemed to be the Home Secretary and the Culture Secretary who were complaining about this lottery money being spent this way whether it's the media or its government ministers frankly I don't think either source of pressure is a Appropriate. If they have problems with the way mo uh, money is being allocated, there are proper ways of scrutinising that and doing it after the event. In the short term, yet again, we're seeing asylum seekers put in a corner and victimised and told that their whole cause, anybody who speaks up to them, regardless of their background or otherwise, is wrong. And I, I think that is a very dangerous thing for us to Alison do. Alison Rice, who asked the question, what do you think? Um, I have to agree that the, the organisation itself I didn't really know much about, but going by the things that have been said in the press and things like that, um, and the, the messages that have been posted on the website, I think that you know, we should be wary of maybe who the money is going to, given that it's the community fund and there's probably a lot more um, organisations out there who conduct themselves in a more appropriate manner on their websites and things like that that would the, benefit the from The website them. accused the Home Secretary of colluding with fascism. That's that was right, the yeah. complaint that he made about it. So you think they should be more careful? Ian Banks. Um, generally you can tell a lot about these things by who's got most annoyed. I don't recall it was the, the Daily Mail and the uh, <laughs> uh, Evening Stand in London. So they must, this, these guys must have been something right, you know. Um, I, mean, I haven't looked at the website, I don't know exactly what they've been saying. Um, but I mean, in general, my sympathies are very much with, with the asylum seekers, and some of the people trying to help them, I think, do deserve some sort of support. That's fair enough. What the interesting thing about this is, though, that it's possibly leading to the idea of, I think it says hypothecation, because they're saying that if when you get your, um, your card you know, for, for the lottery, you can say where you want your money to go, you know? Great idea, as long as we <laughs> then slide that into the voting form, you know. That'll be deselect trident, thank you all, you know. <laughs> so I think it's a foot in the door here. Yeah. Do you, think it, do you think it would work to do that on the lottery ticket, to say where you want the money to go? I have no idea. I've never done the lottery, so I don't know. No, all right, all I wasn't right. going to do it, but I was sorry, if the Haiti one had got it, he was going to do it um, as uh, Richard Branson, sorry. Um, he was going to do it as a non-profit making thing, and I, I've never uh, used the lottery because I don't agree with people making um, okay. money out of it. You, sir? I believe there's uh, two issues at stake here. The first is the separation of the assignment of lottery funds for good causes, keeping that separate from political decision making, and that's absolutely vital. The second one is the Daily Mail uh, taking a big stick to asylum seekers again or any other thing that it doesn't agree with. And I think that that is disgraceful yep. and that should not be permitted. I think it's absolutely vital that there is no political influence on which charities, which good causes get the money. And it, that, that has to be sacrosanct. Okay. And, and you, madam, over there on the right. 
Uh, Jack Straw and David Blunkett have both played the race card. They've tried to outbid Anne Widdicombe uh, in what they, they have been saying. And if anyone were to go to Dungaval Detention Centre and see the state that refugees who have come here um, for safety and thinking this is a humanitarian society, to see the state that they're in would not criticise some money going to an organisation, volunteers who spend all their time trying to get them out of that situation and attempt to, to uh, allow them to stay here, rebuild a life and uh, uh, help the society of this country, as they all want to do. Malcolm Rifkin. <laughs> If this was just an organisation that was helping asylum seekers by giving advice or legal assistance, uh, then I, I would see no reason at all why they should not receive uh, lottery money. They would be a charity like many other charities. But I think what makes this a much more controversial matter is that this organisation is also a political campaigning organisation. It campaigns against the government. Uh, it uh, puts on its website uh, attacks on the Home Secretary. Now, there's nothing wrong with political campaigning but you don't receive public money in order to involve yourself in political campaigns. Uh, because political campaigns should be conducted by people who provide their own resources for that purpose. Charities are there to provide charitable help. There is never any shortage of organizations that are pure charities. If a pure charity is concerning itself with asylum seekers, no problem. But if this organization wants to be a political campaigning organization, then it should get its money elsewhere. But, but, but charities, charities, um... A charity like the RSPCA certainly conducts political campaigns, but gets it, its money privately, not from the lottery. Do you then want to make that distinction if too? If the or lottery not? money can be ring-fenced so that the lottery money is only used for genuine charitable purposes, that is fair enough. Who defines but that, genuine? that distinction is not made at the Who present time. Who defines okay. genuine? Harriet Harman, what do you think? Was Tessa well, Gile right? I think that she was perfectly entitled to ask for the, that particular grant to be looked at, but I think we should get this in perspective because the community fund gives out millions and millions of pounds to good causes. Now, you either require organisations who are applying to funds to fill in thousands and thousands of pages of information about what they're going to do with it, and dot every uh, I and cross every T and make the whole thing incredibly bureaucratic and no risk, and then only very big organisations organizations will be able to apply and get the money or you give it out in a more free and flexible way publish what you're doing which is what they do they're always giving out information about where they're putting their money so it's not secret about how they where they give their money but they've got a kind of as unbureaucratic a process as possible and I think that's right and there are something like 200 organizations in my own constituency who benefit from that money and they just give them the money and ask them to get on with it. So you're not against so, what Lady no, Britain did? Think, you're not against no, her decision? No, absolutely not. I no, think you're you in favour of what be she too, did. You mustn't, you, you mustn't be too risk averse and then find that small organisations can't prove that they're entitled to the money. But I think that there is no coincidence that this is an organisation which is to do uh, with refugees uh, and that this is something that has been raised and campaigned on in the Daily Mail. And I would just say this, is that I have many refugees coming to my constituency from all over the world. And I'll tell you what they do when they get there. They are nurses in our hospitals, they are teachers in our schools, they are sustaining the local economy and the backbone of the local community. And I would say they are very welcome. And those people who jump on the back of this sort of discussion, okay. I don't agree with okay. So you, you, you seem to take issue with the Home Secretary and with the Culture Secretary on that. Nicholas Sturgeon. The culture, no, hang Nicola on. Sturgeon. No, no, you said I took issue with the Culture Secretary. I don't actually know what, what the Home Secretary said, but the Culture Secretary asked the Complained about lottery, being called colluding she, with fascism, she, I assume. No, she asked the Community Fund to look again. If you are prepared to give out money freely, sometimes you have to take a second okay. look, and I think that's perfectly fair Nicola enough Sturgeon. as well. well uh, asylum seekers in this country are, are all the things that Harriet Harman have, have said they are, but they're also people who are coming here from quite horrific circumstances in their own countries. And I think it's deplorable that there are people in this country who will take any opportunity to have a go at asylum seekers. And that's unacceptable. The, the, decisions, the decisions about lottery grants should be made independently and they should be made on their merits. And, and organisations that do work to support asylum seekers do valuable work and certainly should be considered for support from the lottery. Now, I don't think anybody would argue that we should be giving lottery grants to organisations eh, in order for them to run political campaigns. But I was also under the impression that we lived in a country where freedom of speech was a fundamental principle. And the reality is that issues around 
asylum in this country have become very politicised. And one of the reasons they've become politicised is that the government has politicised them because the lady over here was quite right when she said politicians, it, Labour politicians uh, and Tory politicians have used the race card and sought to politicise this issue. So I think we should all uh, calm down a bit about this and remember that work to support asylum seekers in this country is extremely important and okay. I think it is worthy of support from the lottery. All right, let's, let's come, come back if we can to the issue of principle about the lottery and how it should be allocated and indeed the suggestion Ian Banks was talking about that you might be able to say where you wanted the money to go if you bought a card. Yes, sir, you. Yes, Malcolm Rifkin mentioned uh, the spend of public money. Surely when you hand over your pound, it's no longer your money, you're gambling. Uh, are we going to get to the point now we're going to scrutinise bookmakers of what to do with their money? <laughs> Malcolm Rifkin? Well, bookmakers, book, if you give your money to a bookmaker, you're giving it to a private citizen. If you give it to the lottery, you're giving it to a public organisation. These are public funds under Act of Parliament and they should be used for public purposes, not for partisan campaigns. But what do you say to what uh, um, uh, Nicola Sturgeon said and Harriet Harman said, that you, you know, you've, got to, you've just got to take the rough with the smooth on this? But you don't have to take You can perfectly can easily ring fence it. You, so can, you, can, you, you can have a requirement that any money provided uh, from the lottery has to be used for genuine charitable purposes. But do you think Lady Britain doesn't understand this? Well, no, she has to work under the rules the government laid down. And, and you the, think the she hasn't? Do you think the she government hasn't? don't give her that flexibility. You think she hasn't worked under I the haven't rules. studied it in detail, but I, I, so as far as I'm aware, she either has to say yes or no. You're she calling for Leon Britain's wife to resign. I am doing nothing of the All sort. Right. I'm <laughs> sorry to disappoint you. The man, the man with the beard in the front row there, you sir. Well, without much knowledge on these issues, Malcolm Rifkin seems to want to want to gag the press over the rape issue. He wants to gag the campaigning organisation over a worthwhile um, issue that they're trying to portray because they're trying to support those who fall foul of part of the legal system to see whether they can be given second chance. And to gag them there, that, and, and that instance, would deny part of our democracy, which we all claim. Uh, so to, I mean, gagging orders, who, who is next? No, press? Campaigning organisation, what do we gag next? No, I've no desire whatsoever to gag them. They can campaign like anybody say. else can that campaign. That is what you said. But no, the question is whether lottery money should be given to them in order to campaign for political purposes. Okay, you say in the blue tie. The issue. You say in the blue tie. It's and then I'll try to come to you if I can. Yes. It's quite possible that asylum seekers actually buy lottery tickets themselves, so why shouldn't they get some benefit from it? <laughs> okay. And, and you say no. No, no, the man inspectors. Man inspectors. No, no, in the third row, please. That's it. The, uh, the real issue, surely, is the amount of money available and the pressure on that money. Uh, Harriet Harman is right, of course, that uh, this is spread around. It's spread around because the government takes 30% of all the money before the prizes, then there's the prizes, and at one time, uh, all the rest of it went to good causes. Now a third of all that money, which we think go to good causes, go to something what the government calls the New Opportunities Fund. And, of course and what wasn't... that is, is a fund to fund those things which in practice most of us think we're paying taxes for. Would you like to see it? Would you like, just briefly, would you, would, you like, would you like to see lottery money take the place of taxation to some extent then or not? Well, that, that's in fact what the government's done. And do you like that or not? No, I do not like okay. it. I think <laughs> all the, all the, gov all the it, lottery funding go, should okay. go as the people who play the lottery, believe, right. goes to good funds, not okay. to replace government money right. in the new opportunities. Yeah. We've got to stop you now. Out, you missed out uh, Camelot's not in considerable profits. So OK, we've got to stop. Time. We've got to stop. Our time's up, I'm sorry. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to all of you who came here to be with us in Glasgow. Next week we're going to be in Leeds and with us